What's up, everybody? Today, I'm interviewing Simon Hill. Simon's the founder of plantproof.com, the host of the Plant Proof podcast, and the author of a book called The Proof is in the Plants. And we are going to talk about plants. Doesn't that sound interesting? <laughs> Specifically, eating a plant-based diet. We're going to talk about nutrition and how he got into this world and uh, and what he's learned and uh, I'm excited to, to connect. So good to see you, Simon. Thanks, Chris. Great to be here. I'm uh, a big fan of everything that you do. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this chat and uh, seeing where it goes. Thanks. That's great. Uh, so how did you get into plant-based eating? You want the short story or the long story? You can tell whatever version <laughs> of the story you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've always been very interested in science uh, ever since I was a little kid. Uh, my dad is a professor and for, you know, as, as long as I can recall, I remember coming home and, and being surrounded by clinical studies that he would have had printed out and they were all highlighted and scribbled on and they were in his car and on the desk and on in the kitchen everywhere. And, and so science has been something that I was exposed to from the very beginning. And while I didn't really understand, you know, the specifics of what my dad was looking at, I could see how important science was to him and, and, what he taught me was that science is our method for testing our hypotheses, for testing our intuition and reducing uncertainty so that as, as people, as, as humans, we can make decisions with more confidence that help improve our lives, improve our health, our well-being, our longevity, um, and our, our overall human experience. So, uh, I always knew that I would go through school and eventually find myself working in some area of science. And, uh, you know, at some stage I, I thought about becoming a doctor and, uh, I ended up doing physiotherapy. I think in, in America it's called physical therapy. So that was a, a four year, uh, undergraduate degree which is a very evidence-based course. Uh, there's a lot of anatomy and physiology and, uh, you know, basic science in that course, but very much the course is focused on, you know, rehabilitation, biomechanics, helping people recover from injuries. And I was particularly interested in the uh, sports physiotherapy side of things and found my way into uh, working with professional footballers in Australia and, uh, you know, I realized uh, along, along the way that when it came to nutrition, you know, I was, I was working with these elite athletes and I could feel within the clubs, there was a big gap, a nutritional gap in terms of the information that players were getting. And it certainly wasn't my role to be giving them that information, but there was no one else there that was providing it. And so, uh, it became very apparent to me that my, uh, my nutritional choices that I was making for myself and pretty much all of the, the, the way that the players were eating was, was really guided by fitness culture and not evidence. And so I, you know, at that stage, having gone through my undergraduate, I had an appreciation for how science can, can help us make these better choices and, you know, along, along the, the, the way I was inspired to go back to university and do a master's in nutrition science and uh, try and make sense of things a little more. And, uh, you know, I was, I was like everyone else, I think going into that, that uh, study, um, I, I saw all of the conflicting information in the headlines and I was bamboozled. You know, one week I would read one thing and then the next week I would read the other. I'd have one friend saying one thing, another friend saying the other. I'd have one family member eating this way, another family member eating another way. And so I really wanted to get the skills so I could get into the literature and make sense of things for myself. Uh, and I guess to, to kind of uh, 
some extra, extra motivation that I had that really inspired me to get back was thinking about my family's experience with health. And when I was 15 years old, I uh, saw for the very first time what loss of health looks like. And it was a very uh, frightening experience for me. I was with my dad. It was just, just him and I on this day. And he had an, an acute heart attack in front of me. And, uh, you know, he was flown by helicopter to the nearest hospital. And there was a long period where I, I didn't know if he would survive. And he was from the outside, you know, a, a sort of, uh, for, all, for all intents and purposes, he looked like a healthy young Australian dad. And he was doing everything that you're kind of told to do. And everything that everyone's doing in your community. It wasn't like he was, you know, severely overweight or not exercising or eating in a way that everyone else wasn't. He was adopted. He had adopted the typical Australian lifestyle, including the typical Australian diet. And the, the healthcare service services in Australia are, are incredible. And if it wasn't for that helicopter, he probably wouldn't have survived. And for many people, you know, they don't get a second chance. And, uh, you know, very, we were very, very thankful that he did. Uh, but at the same time, very shocked that this could happen to someone who is, who is only 41 years of age and has no clinical diagnosis and wasn't relying on the healthcare system at all. Uh, and in our sort of debrief with the cardiologist, the, the cardiologist told my brother and I, and my brother was 18, I was 15, that having taken my dad's history, his uh, dad, our grandfather, had also had a heart attack and that cardiovascular disease was clearly running in our family uh, and that as we get older, this is going to be something we need to keep an eye on and get screened for, which is not bad advice, but really that's where the conversation ended. And so for many, many years, I was of the view that we'd been dealt this genetic card. And, you know, as my brother and I got a little bit older, this was going to be something that perhaps we would have to deal with. And I really didn't think about, I tried to really just put it into the back of my mind and get on with my life. And, and no one in our family was really encouraged to, to examine the way we were living. And so when, when I did decide to go back and do the master's in nutrition science, part of the inspiration was knowing what had, had occurred to my father and, and also getting some information around that time that, hey, you know, perhaps our genetics do predispose us to certain diseases, but there is a lot more that we can do through our lifestyle and a large part of that being the food that we eat three, four times a day. So really all of that kind of came together, coalesced into the perfect storm of uh, seeing me enroll back into university and, and doing my master's in nutrition science and then uh, plant proof. And, and the book, The Proof is in the Plants, is kind of the, the, the sort of product of, of all of that. You know, there's a lot of parallels there uh, in your story the first of which being this idea that or someone who's healthy on the outside, right, is healthy on the inside. There's a lot mm -hmm. of people walking around that that look healthy and we assume are healthy uh, because, and maybe they're very fit, right? Maybe they, they really look good <laughs> on the beach, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Uh, but fitness and health are not synonymous, as you mm -hmm. know, you know, being involved with professional footballers, I'm sure. Uh, fitness can produce a, a level of health, but if you've got, uh, if you've got chronic inflammation, chronic immunosuppression, you can still be fit. You know, mm -hmm. if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you can still be fit. Um, but those are, uh, you know, you're in dangerous territory physiologically to develop disease. And, um, you know, when you were younger and you said, I thought, you know, 
I have this family history, right? And you, I'm, I'm sure you just sort of felt powerless at that point. And that's very common. We have so many people who have lost a parent to heart disease or to cancer, or have parents who are overweight or diabetic, right? And are on a lot of medications who have never been told, right? Hey, this is not your fate, mm-hmm. right? You Just because your mom had it doesn't mean you'll get it. Uh, but if you follow the same diet and lifestyle patterns as your parents, then yeah, then you probably will end up with the same diseases they get because you know what we're dealing with really, <laughs> right, is an epidemic of chronic disease caused by our diet and lifestyle choices. And we're all eating the same horrible food and not taking care of ourselves, not exercising and, and putting on the extra pounds. And so chronic disease manifests differently in different people, but the root causes are all very similar, right? Yeah. And I write about, uh, a study in the book that I thought was quite interesting because, you know, what you're speaking to is this is just so crucial to understand that these chronic diseases that we have normalized, we've accepted them in our society. And, and like you say, you know, everyone has, has either had someone in their family develop one of these chronic diseases or family friends or, you know, parents of your friends. Uh, but in other societies, it's, it's not like that. So um, we are a product of our environment. And this study that I write about in the book looked at uh, a large group of people from Sweden and they, they looked specifically at people who own dogs. And they were able to see that owners who had a dog that had type two diabetes were also significantly more likely to have type two diabetes themselves. And, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 you know, it, this speaks to the fact that we, when we share our lifestyles with all of those around us, including our pets, we should, we share our risk for chronic disease. And so, you, you know, you're exactly right. And when the penny drops, and I can remember when I was coming across this information, you all of a sudden flip from powerless, disempowered to in control to empowered and you know it's it's just such a better mindset to be in and it is the reality we have so much more control than than many of us believe and uh you know that's why i'm so thankful for the work that you do and 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 getting this message out and and helping people make sense of 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 what a healthy diet looks like in uh, a society that can make that rather confusing Well, the victim's mentality is never helpful, right? Yeah. In any situation. And, and, you know, I think anyone with a chronic disease, and I'm mostly I'm talking about cancer, right? When I, in my interviews and podcasts and things, but almost any patient with chronic disease, when they go to the doctor, they are uh, usually not deliberately, but inadvertently victimized. And what I mean by that is they are told there's nothing they did to contribute to their disease and there's nothing they can do to help themselves, right? It's like, oh, well, you've got diabetes. We have these drugs for you. You've got high blood pressure. Here's a drug for that, right? You've got high cholesterol. Here's a drug for that. You've got cancer. Here's drugs for that or surgery or radiation. And there is no empowerment. And so whether it's a cancer patient or diabetic or heart disease or you know, name a chronic disease, the the patient is not given any information, any resources, any tools to help themselves. They're not educated at all. They're only given a prescription to help mitigate symptoms, to help them live with their condition. And uh, and that over time creates a, a, a person who is discouraged, depressed, hopeless, right? And I obviously I love what you're doing because we're doing the same things, which is encouraging people and helping them understand that your choices matter, that you can change the way you're living each day. And those changes can have powerful results in your life over time. If you stick with them, if you consistently change the way you eat and the way you think and the way you live, start taking care of yourself in a way that you never have before, you're going to see some 
wonderful, significant improvements in your life. <laughs> yeah. Like that's, th this is great. And what you, exactly what you said is this is empowering people. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I often think ex about exactly that point. And, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that I don't think people with chronic disease are intentionally making decisions that are bad for their health. I think a lot of this is we are in an environment that is stacked against us. You know, it's so much easier to make the bad decision. And, you know, what I would like to see is the medical community and, and uh, the conversations in, in the consultations that you're talking to, talking to that and, and not letting, not, not helping people play victim and playing into that but explaining to them there's a difference between that and acknowledging that you have been making bad decisions or decisions that aren't great for your health. Yes, that is a result of the environment, but let's understand what that environment looks like. Why is it stacked against you? And then once you understand that and you can see it, you can start to build some tools and strategies to better navigate it, to, to make better decisions in spite of that environment that that really is set up to help you develop chronic disease as fast as possible. I agree. I think ma the majority of people don't know that what they're doing is harming them, right? Some do, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to find a smoker that doesn't know it causes mm -hmm. cancer, right? I'm pretty sure they all know now it's the number one cause of cancer, but uh, most people don't know that the number two cause of cancer is obesity. Mm -hmm. They don't know that they're, you know, it's a, it's such a sensitive topic. It's not discussed and doctors don't want to tell their patients to lose weight because they don't want to hurt their feelings. This is what sort of medicine is sort of devolved in this in, to, to become sort of this pandering, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a delicate, right. Thin ice relationship where we, we just don't want to say anything that might hurt the person's feelings or might them, make them feel bad. And, the, the best thing you can do for someone is tell them the truth. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the truth stings a little, but the truth is empowering. And so, you know, yeah, my intention is never to beat anyone up about their choices. I had the revelation that the way I was living was killing me, mm -hmm. right? That was my first major revelation after cancer. And it was like, okay, well, if that's true, then I need to change the way I'm living. Mm -hmm. like, I need to change. This is on me. I can't blame anybody else right? I need to see what I can change in my life. So, you know, a lot of people don't want to hear that message, <laughs> mm. right? but it's important. It, it, what, yeah, it is important. I mean, if you look at smoking, for example, the science was very clear that smoking was causing lung cancer back in the 1940s. It took 30, 40 years. I mean, still to this day, I can't believe that cigarettes are still sold, but it took 30, 40 years for a lot of regulations to come in place, tax, taxes for doctors to start recommending people quit smoking. Uh, and so I think we would be silly if, if we were waiting for this food environment to change. People need real information. They need to understand what is what foods are actually nourishing them and contributing to better health, what foods are causing disease, and then, you know, the, the strategies to help them do that. And I think, you know, whether we're talking about obesity or we're talking about uh, excessive consumption of ultra processed foods and the diet, I don't think we should be ignoring that. Uh, I do see that conversation out there. I know what you're talking about. I think it's a case of just approaching it with the right bedside manner and having these discussions in a, in a thoughtful, non-judgmental, non-shameful kind of way. And, you know, I think that will ultimately lead to, to empowering people the most. I agree. That study about, uh, people with obese dogs tend to be, mm. oh, oh, sorry, diabetic dogs tend to be yeah. diabetic is amazing. Now I want to know if there's a study on pets with cancer and their owners having cancer. I, I'm really curious about that. Mm -hmm. See if anybody's found a correlation there, but, uh, it actually reminds me, and this is sort of tied into what we're talking about right now is it reminds me of this study that I talk about often about, uh, in an obese environment, a person's immune cells are obese. Mm -hmm. And this is relatively new research, but what happens, and this is why obesity is the second leading cause of cancer. And 
you end up in the highest risk factor for uh, infectious disease if you're obese because your immune cells they absorb they take up excess fatty acids that are floating in your bloodstream and they become slow and sluggish and ineffective right so we we often think of oh being overweight or obese as uh, just external mm-hmm. right you've got extra fat on the outside but it's the internal the, the body found on the outside that people can see is really not the biggest problem mm-hmm. it's the internal mm-hmm, right definitely. thing that's happening which is excess hormone production that fuels cancer growth excess inflammation and immunosuppression mm-hmm. and so the empowering you know the message is sort of two prong one is hey being overweight or obese is way worse for you than you realize but b you can change right by losing weight you can drop your risk of cancer mm-hmm. heart disease and diabetes right you can strengthen your immune system like this is really good news mm-hmm. yeah and some of that information that you just shared then is is very interesting and really important as well and it, it often i get asked about bmi whether it's a great indicator of of obesity and uh adiposity and I think at a population level, it certainly is, but waist circumference can be another very good measure, particularly for looking at more central adiposity and visceral uh, adiposity, which is kind of what you're talking to uh, or closely related to anyway. So, um, yeah, I, I've, I totally I've seen agree. that. Yeah. The research where you sort of like a yes you want to get into a healthy bmi range mm-hmm. like that's step one if you're overweight or obese let's get you into a healthy bmi and then step two is uh i've seen that that research where people with a healthy bmi quote unquote but they have excess belly fat are still subject to the mm-hmm. the risks of being overweight or obese right that's what yeah you're about. and 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 if you take you know the two people with that are overweight or obese, there is a stronger argument for some of those, some of those people may have a, a greater preference uh, for fat storage uh, more subcutaneously, not centrally. And uh, you'll see it more around their sort of hips and thighs area. Uh, whereas uh, there is a strong argument for, someone who has more greater central adiposity and visceral adiposity and a greater waist circumference, that's, that's the kind of person who you would generally want to, to see more aggressive weight loss in because they're at even higher risk than, than the sort of uh, former person that I described there. Earlier, you mentioned, um, you know, how difficult it is that the odds are stacked against us in terms of being healthy. And I just want to, uh echo that point uh because most of us i say most of us most of the people who probably listen to your podcast or mine (laughs) live in western nations Mm -hmm. right they live in industrialized countries where food is everywhere Mm -hmm. right processed food uh created in factories or raised on factory farms right is everywhere and when you live in a in a land of abundance right you're never going to go hungry and uh so we just have access to food 24 hours a day seven days a week we never go hungry and it's easy to gain weight for most Mm -hmm. people when food is everywhere so not you know this is not to fault anyone it's just like hey you know this is it's it's sort of like uh you know every blessing you know can come with a burden right Mm -hmm. and the blessing of being in a a wealthy nation with unlimited resources is uh you're gonna have uh you're gonna have the trappings Mm -hmm. (laughs) of wealth right yeah and i think i think it's important for us to also just think about history and when i say history here i'm talking about just the last 120 years so not a long time but there was early 1900s the the nutrition related problems were deficiency related disorders uh beriberi or scurvy for example or rickets yeah and so establishing a, a greater food security and the, the the you know the modern supply chain that we established there was a lot of good intent there and it did help the the these western nations prosper in many ways but i think what people weren't aware of was this was going to be the start of a chronic disease pandemic 
And, uh, you know, today we see diets have, have transformed a lot. And we see now in America, 60% of calories are coming every day from ultra processed foods. And really, I mean, that's, that's at the sort of heart and center, I think, of a lot of the chronic disease that we see. And it's certainly the biggest shift that's occurred in, in diets in these developed nations. And there are you know, quite a few studies now, at large epidemiology studies, which have shown uh, correlation associations between high consumption of ultra processed foods and cancer mortality, as well as cardiovascular uh, disease mortality. But even short-term trials, there was a, a, a metabolic ward study done by Kevin Hall. I'm, I'm sure you've probably come across it. And yeah, the NUSI study. This, well, this, yeah, this, I think NUSI may have funded this one. Uh, or, and it kind of or, backfired on them. <laughs> yeah. So that was a separate paper. That was the low carb ketogenic one. I think you're talking yeah. about versus the plant-based. That's an interesting study. But just before that, Kevin Hall, uh, who is you know well well uh known for doing these very tightly controlled metabolic ward studies and if, if that's a new term for anyone that just means bringing people in and into an inpatient sort of setting in a in a hospital so that when you conduct these eating trials you know exactly what they're eating they can't sneak anything else in and he he wanted to just uh really understand uh if ultra processed foods are uh, are created in a way that drives excessive calorie consumption. And but he did this study in a really neat way. He essentially uh, brought brought in these subjects and it was a crossover trial. So each subject got to do two diets. Each diet went for two weeks. And so one diet was completely unprocessed and then the next diet was ultra processed. Subjects did them in randomized order. Now, the interesting thing that he did was he matched the ultra processed diet and the unprocessed diet for fat, for protein, for carbohydrates, for sugar, for fiber, and for sodium. And that's really, that's really interesting because that's significant. Yeah. Yeah. Many of us would think, well, I think ultra processed foods are, are driving over consumption because they're low in fiber. They're high in sugar. Uh, they're probably lower in protein, for example. Um, and there could be many sort of reasons why you might say ultra processed foods are, are driving over consumption, obesity, increasing risk of, of cancer. Uh, but he matched these and yet still on the ultra processed food diet, Subjects ate around 500 calories more per day, and across so across the study in the in the two week on the ultra processed diet, people gained about a kilogram in weight, and then in the two week on the unprocessed diet, they lost about a kilogram. So there was a two kilogram difference uh, over the course of a month, and the the researchers sort of were a little surprised by that and uh, hypothesized as to what they think was driving that, that excessive calorie consumption, despite all of those different nutrients being matched. And they, they sort of, it came down to two different hypotheses that they have, and maybe they'll test going forward. But one is that they, the ultra processed foods are more calorie dense. So more calories per bite, you can eat those foods quicker. And I think that there's some, there's definitely something to that. Uh, you know, we all know if you grab a very calorie dense cake, for example, uh, you're going to be able to eat a lot more calories in a shorter period of time before you fill up compared to say eating potato. Um, and then the second hypothesis is that uh, fiber, the fiber was matched by essentially just adding in uh, sort of fortifying these ultra processed food products with fiber, but I'm not sure. And they, they allude to this, that simply adding one type of fiber to an ultra processed food matches the many different types of prebiotic fiber that are found naturally in whole plant foods. And this might be a good learning for us that we can't just hack our way to, you know, taking supplements and expect it to match what's found in whole plant foods. And and so the idea there is that different types of fiber are feeding different uh, species of bacteria, you know, that 
uh, reside in our coal and our large intestine. Uh, there's 38 trillion odd microbes in there. And uh, in order to promote a, a healthy, uh, diverse range of these microbes, uh, you require a diverse range of prebiotic fiber. All of these different substrates of fiber you know, the fiber in a banana is different to the fiber found in Brussels sprouts is different to the fiber in brown rice. They all selectively feed different bacteria. And one of the uh, neat things that happens here is that these bacteria as they're feeding on prebiotic fiber are producing certain metabolites. And some of these metabolites act as precursors to various appetite suppressing hormones so it may be that if you're not supplying your body with a, a wide variety of these prebiotic fiber substrates you're not getting the same level of of uh, appetite su suppressing hormone production as you're eating and therefore you're not getting the signal to slow down and you end up over consuming Example that I love to use is it's like comparing a tablespoon of oil, which is 120 calories, right? Any oil basically is about 120 calories for a tablespoon and a banana, right? If you're hungry, right? If you're, if you're feeling a little bit hungry and you just need a little snack and I, and I said, here, you can have either this mm -hmm. banana or a tablespoon of oil, a calorie is a calorie right? Like which one's going to fill you up? The banana, like you got so much more bulk and processed foods are also, yeah, typically there's a lot of oils used in processed foods. And so they have sneaky, sneakily high levels of calories, right? Mm -hmm. Even fast food, like you think about anything that's fried is saturated in oil. And that's one of the biggest sources of calories that sneak up on people. They don't realize the concentrated calories are getting in oils. And uh, so anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I love that saying a calorie is a calorie because I mean, it's true from an energy point of view, but it's, it's not so true when you consider what foods those calories are coming in and how those foods are affecting your health outcomes. That can be uh, quite different. Uh, I like the, um, I'm glad you brought up prebiotics and fiber and the microbiome because uh <sighs> The cool thing, I'm always asked about probiotics, right? People are constantly, mm -hmm. would you take probiotics? What kind do you like? You know, and uh, the, the richest source of probiotics is plant food, mm. <laughs> raw fruits and vegetables. There's 100 million bacteria in an apple, and 90% of that is in the corn and the seeds, which most people don't eat, but of course you can, and I do. But there's this beautiful balance where when you eat, and I'm not a raw foodist, but I eat a lot of raw fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. When you eat raw, you're getting good bacteria, maybe a little bad too, but that's okay. You're getting a ton of good bacteria and, and you're getting the fiber that feeds that good bacteria, right? So you're getting prebiotics and probiotics when you're eating plant food, especially uncooked. So, um, yeah, I don't take a probiotic. <laughs> it's a, it's a, a funny question. I get it as well a lot. And, uh, you know, my kind of position on probiotics is that there are so many things to be focusing on first. And, and one of those is certainly eating a wide variety of whole plant foods that are rich in all of these different prebiotics, which act as fertilizer for the good gut bugs that you have. Um, do you eat fermented foods? Yes. Yeah. There was a, a recent study uh, that came out of Stanford not sure if you've saw, seen that one. It, it compared fiber to fermented foods, looking at the microbiome diversity and inflammation. No, talk about uh, it. Yeah, really interesting. So uh, led by the, the Sonnenbergs, who are sort of uh, quite famous gut microbiome researchers at Stanford and Dr. Christopher Gardner. And they what they wanted to see was is there a difference between increasing fiber in the diet versus adding fermented foods in terms of the composition of the microbiome 
we know that a more diverse microbiome is associated with better health. Uh, typically people who are a healthier body weight, who are at lower risk of chronic diseases like type two diabetes and various cancers have that more diverse microbiome. They wanted to see if these foods affected that, but also they wanted to see if these foods affected and modulated the immune system and whether there was an effect on inflammation. Again, because we know that chronic inflammation is a hallmark feature of many of these different chronic diseases. So really interesting study. And I love when, when researchers go and conduct very tightly controlled, randomized controlled trials because they give us you know, great information um, that is, is quite reliable. And so they, they brought the subjects in, they split them into two different groups. These were healthy subjects. They took a baseline reading of their microbiome composition. This was done through a stool sample. And uh, they had one group increase their fiber intake from 20 grams a day. That was the average of that group at the start up to 40. And they had the other group add fermented foods to their diet, like kimchi and sauerkraut and uh, raw kombucha, for example. Now, did and they ha have them eat more fibrous foods or just take a fiber supplement? So they, the, it's a great question. So the fiber group, they actually said to get it all from whole plants just to increase their, the foods in their diet. Got it. So no supplement. And the fermented food, the, the uh, prescription was to have six serves of fermented foods a day, uh, which is interesting. We can perhaps double back to that's why significant. They, that's a lot. And yeah. I, I, I don't think I've ever got close to that. And I, I'm not sure that's actually achievable for many people. So maybe we, <laughs> yeah. circ we can circle back to that at the end uh, and try and make sense of it. But so the study went for 10 weeks and across this study subjects were, were, uh, collecting stool samples each week. Uh, and then they were being analyzed and really fascinating results. So let's start with the, the really clear cut take home message here. Fermented foods across the board, increased microbiome diversity and drove inflammation down significantly. So that's a big tick. And that's, you know, quite a compelling study uh, for us to, to sort of use to guide our diets. You know, if we can add some more kimchi or kraut to our meals, that's great. On the other hand, the response to the increase in fiber to really surprise the researchers certainly surprised me. It was a very individualized response. So they, what they saw was that certain people adding the, the fiber to their diet did have a reduction in inflammation, but for others, it actually increased their inflammation. And I can kind of make sense of this thinking about working with people on a one-to-one -one basis. There are certain people when you do increase the amount of fiber in their diet, they report feeling a little bit uncomfortable. They're not sure whether these plant foods are suited to them. And the researchers thought, wow, that's interesting. Why would there be this sort of personalized response here? And they went back and looked at the baseline microbiome composition. And it was very clear if, if, you, if the subjects had uh, a very rich, uh, diverse microbiome, they handled the increased fiber very well and, and it worked great for them. Those who had more of a weaker gut microbiome who lacked that diversity at baseline, this jump from 20 to 40 seemed to rev up their inflammation. And so uh, this is not to say that fiber is bad for certain people the takeaway more is that for certain people, depending on where their baseline is at, they may need some different strategies and tools to use to lean into to increase the diversity of their microbiome before they go increasing their fiber by too much. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And I would love to see that study and read it, uh, send it to me after the interview, but, and we'll link to it in the, in the notes. Um, so my first, I, what I would love to know is, and I'm, I imagine they didn't do this, but I would love to know is what happens to the person who's increased their fiber over time, right? So they had this initial spike, their bodies are like, whoa, too much fiber. We don't know what to, know how to handle this, right? And then over time, as we know that our bodies are adaptive, I, I, my first question would be, I would hypothesize that that inflammation would decrease over time and that, right, their, their, their microbiome 
would become more diverse, right? And their their digestive system would adapt and their body would adapt and and things would get better, but they would have that, even though they had that short-term initial, uh, you know, um, discomfort and, and increased inflammation. Because we see that all the time. Like when mm-hmm. people make a radical diet change, a lot of times they feel bad in the beginning. They don't feel better, right? They, they get a little worse before they feel better. And low energy, maybe some aches and pains, some inflammation, digestive, you know, discomfort, whatever, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, in our community, we're always encouraging folks just, just, just stay with it. Like, you know, <laughs> just get over that initial hump. It's usually just the first week. Uh, and I don't, I don't know how long they had these people eating this way for. It was a couple of weeks, maybe. It was a, a 10 week study. However, the researchers did hypothesize that perhaps it may take a little longer, even beyond 10 weeks. If they had to run the study for four, six months, maybe they would have seen those people adapt, as you say, uh, gets expensive to run a study that long. Yeah. 10 uh, weeks is pretty long though. Yeah. 10 weeks yeah. Is, is 10 weeks is, is pretty long. So, um, you know, they, they're now going to go and do some other studies. And one of the studies that they're looking at is, okay, well, if someone is, uh, perhaps a little more sensitive, uh, then are there other strategies that they can lean into to help them incorporate more plants and increase their fiber over time without revving up their inflammation? And one of those ideas is the addition of fermented foods in conjunction with that or the addition of fermented foods first to increase microbiome diversity and then slowly up the fiber intake. Um, Yeah, they really need that third group, right? Yeah. That gets both the more yeah. fiber and the fermented foods together and see what happens. See yeah, that's so, so this is exactly what I did. This was my cancer healing diet. I was eating uh, all raw giant salads, giant bowls of broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, onions, mushrooms, sprouts, uh, sauerkraut or kimchi on the salad every day, apple cider vinegar in the salad dressing. And I ate that giant salad twice a day, every day for mm-hmm. lunch and dinner. And so it was a massive, massive, radical shift from eating no fiber (laughs) to eating like crazy amounts of vegetation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I don't know how my inflammation markers were, and I really don't know what's happening in my body, but I did feel bad for, you know, a little less than than a week getting going and then started to feel really good. But I was doing that, right? I had Mm -hmm. a huge jump in fiber and started eating fermented foods simultaneously. And that's still what we encourage folks to do. And I didn't know anything. I didn't have any science at all. I just, you know, had was just read a few books that were saying, you, you know, these are good for you, mm-hmm. right? Broccoli's good for you. Uh, sauerkraut's good for you. Apple cider vinegar is good for you. Mm-hmm. You should eat it. And so, yeah, was just, that's, that's what I was going off of. Now the science makes it mm-hmm. even more fun to talk about. I know uh, Dr. Will Bolsowitz, I think. Have you had him on your show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, uh, one of his favorite salads, he calls it a salad. I'm not sure if this can pass as a salad. It's almost too simple. Is He just gets a big pile of broccoli sprouts and kraut on top with some lemon drizzled over and that's it. And you'd be surprised. I've, I've, I've tried that and that's, that's definitely a winner if you're looking for something super simple. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I love, I've never done that. And I love it. I'll have to, I'll have to do it. Um, so what are some of the other things that you've learned, uh, just in research in, in researching your book, which mm-hmm. again is called the proof is in the plants that's really surprised you because obviously you started eating plant-based when, mm-hmm. how long has it been? Nearly seven years now. Okay. Seven yeah. years. And, uh, yeah. W- w- what were some other surprises? You know, I've, I've always been uh, quite interested in cardiovascular disease because of my family history. You know, we all yeah. kind of, we all zoom in on, on, on the, the uh, disease or disorder that kind of affects us or our families. Uh, so I, I had a sort of healthy obsession with reading all of the literature, looking at cardiovascular disease. And um, particularly, I was interested in looking at atherosclerosis and the narrowing of our arteries we have you know four major arteries that supply blood oxygenated blood into our heart our heart just like other um, you know muscles in our body it requires oxygenated blood in order to pump and uh, you know when these uh, arteries become blocked 
it impairs the the blood flow to those muscles and you can end up with damage to the heart or in the case of a stroke you know damage and, and the arteries that go up through your neck damage to the tissues in our brain and uh, you know, there are a number of different uh, risk factors for developing atherosclerosis, but one in particular is elevated cholesterol. And, uh, you know, I find it uh, somewhat surprising that this is still a little bit debated in, it sure in, is. in certain circles. Um, but I think that when you, when you do look at the totality of the evidence, it is very clear uh, that it's a good idea to keep our uh, LDL cholesterol down uh, more specifically. Uh, and what is being spoken about more now is what's called ApoB lipoprotein. Uh, and so uh, without going into the weeds too much, but people may hear that uh, the LDL particle is not actually what causes atherosclerosis. It's actually the fact that these LDL particles contain what's called an ApoB lipoprotein. And that ApoB lipoprotein is what causes the LDL particle to enter into the artery wall and get stuck and build up. And what you'll see in the next five to 10 years and already starting now, when you walk in to get a, a, a checkup annually or however, however frequently you go, instead of a lipid test that just tests for LDL cholesterol, the test and the gold standard already now is ApoB. That is the best predictor of your risk of uh, having a, a developing coronary heart disease. So that's a, a, a good one for people to be mindful of. I, I think that you will only hear people talking about this more and more um, going forward, but there, there is, uh, there is data uh, from multiple different types of science that all shows that ApoB is causal in the development of atherosclerosis. That is that when you are exposed to elevated ApoB over uh, uh, a lifetime, you are at increased risk of developing uh, coronary heart disease. And when I say multiple different types of studies, we have genetic studies. So people who are blessed with a genetic variant that lowers their ApoB, they have significantly lower risk of coronary heart disease. On the other hand, people who have familial hypercholesterolemia, who have elevated LDL cholesterol and ApoB, they have significantly greater risk of coronary heart disease. Some of these people will develop atherosclerosis and coronary heart disease in their teenage years. We have large observational studies that show populations of people that have higher LDL cholesterol have higher incidence of coronary heart disease. And then we have lots of randomized controlled trials with different pharmaceutical drugs where you lower someone's LDL cholesterol and they have lower risk of coronary heart disease. Now, uh, I, those studies don't produce as good a result as, as does a genetic lowering. And that's an important point. If you go your whole lifetime for 40, 50 years with high LDL cholesterol and then have jump on pharmaceuticals, you lower your risk by a little bit, but you've already had such a big lifetime exposure that it's, it's, it's a very different uh, reduction in risk versus someone who had low LDL cholesterol their entire life or for as long as possible. And that's a good take home point for anyone who's listening, who perhaps is a teenager or in their early twenties and thinks, you know, I can deal with this later. You want to start now because these, these things do bubble away under the surface. And even though they often become symptomatic when people are in their sort of fifth or sixth decade of life, you're very much laying down the, the foundations for that disease earlier in your life. Uh, and, and so you may wonder, you know, well, what elevates ApoB when it comes or LDL cholesterol when it comes to our diet? And again, this is, this has been uh, very clearly shown in the literature uh, from a, from a dietary perspective, saturated fats and trans fats, we know from very high quality metabolic ward studies, bring people in, 
feed them these uh, typically it's animal fats because animal fats are rich in saturated fat, feed them saturated fats. You see their cholesterol, LDL cholesterol goes up, feed them plant fats, unsaturated fats, and it goes down. Uh, and then there are a number of different, uh, you know, large observational studies that look at substitution analyses is, is, is what they're called. And it's very clear if you swap calories from saturated fat, say, for example, from red meat or from dairy, for calories from polyunsaturated fats, say nuts and seeds, or monounsaturated fats, say avocado or whole grains, you lower your risk of coronary heart disease. So all in all, um, I think that body of literature is very, very clear and compelling. And it's now, you know, it's, it's now a consensus, whether you look at the European Atherosclerosis Society, or you look at the guidelines out just last week from the American Heart Association, all of them are re reiterating all of those points. And then their take home message consistently is to eat less ultra processed foods, to uh, eat more fruits and vegetables, to eat more fiber, and when it comes to protein, it was really nice to see the American Heart Association just last week update their recommendations to say, choose plant protein more frequently. So uh, I guess that's uh, an area of interest. And in I guess that was a bit of a long-winded uh, answer. No, that's great. It's, and it's encouraging that the American Heart Association has made that revision. And I also would like to point out that uh, you know, this cholesterol debate, most of it is driven by what I like to refer to as meat lovers bias. And those are people, doctors, scientists, you know, and regular people who love to eat animals. <laughs> so, mm. right, they're, they're heavily biased toward eating meat because they want to have steak for dinner. So they, uh, they are, you know, bend over backwards to try to justify uh, high cholesterol. And then you have, this is coming full circle. You have a population of people in the U S and Canada, Australia, the UK, who everyone has elevated cholesterol because we're all eating a ton of animal <laughs> food, right? The they, average, uh, cholesterol is a, about 125 to 130 milligrams per deciliter, which is, and you know, that's well just above, the LDL you're talking about. That's just the LDL, which, right. uh, is well above where it should be. And even in this country and in Australia, uh, normal, quote unquote, normal LDL cholesterol is, is kind of positioned at about 100 milligrams per deciliter. But right. we know very clearly from lots of studies looking at uh, healthy uh, adult populations, in, in, until you get it down to 70 milligrams per deciliter or lower, you're, you're still developing most people are still developing atherosclerosis so you can be at 100 milligrams per deciliter getting your annual checkup thinking your cholesterol levels are great but actually they are still elevated above the optimal level and yeah it's 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 somewhat ironic that uh, actually the the author of the paleo diet lauren cordain uh he he uh actually published a paper called the optimal uh, LDL uh, cholesterol level is between 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter. So even he has acknowledged that that is the level. Uh, unfortunately, uh, people have kind of taken the, the paleo diet and run with it and, and really transformed it into something other than what he was trying to earlier communicate. Lots of butter and bacon. Yeah. yeah. And well, so I, I, I'm not entirely sure if the measurements used in, in Australia and the U.S. are the same, but I know in the U.S., uh, basically, if your, your total cholesterol is under 200, you're considered normal. Mm -hmm. And we have this unhealthy population dilemma where normal is unhealthy, right? Like, oh, your cholesterol is normal. Well, guess what? Look around, right? Look at how many people... In the U.S., 70% are overweight, over 40% are obese. Uh, you know, the prescription drugs uh, uh, the, uh, are an epidemic. Uh, and uh, I mean, prescription drug taking, excuse me, is it like at epidemic levels? And so normal means unhealthy. 
And that is, uh, people go to the, the doctor's office, they get their blood checked. And because all the goalposts have been moved, right? Mm -hmm. all these blood parameters and blood markers have been moved because now unhealthy is normal, right? But getting yeah. under 150 total cholesterol, which is like, again, right in line with what you're talking about. Yeah, there's a study I'll, I'll send to you to put in the show notes. And there's a great uh, graph for people to look at. It's called the PISA study, progression of early subclinical atherosclerosis. Had this study included over 4,000 people and they took uh, healthy adults that had all varying levels of LDL cholesterol. And they used ultrasound to actually look at the amount of fatty plaque buildup. And you can see very clearly on this exactly what we're talking about and what I explained that at that optimal level, or sorry, at that quote unquote normal level of a hundred milligrams per deciliter for LDL, almost half of the, the, the subjects in that study had significant atherosclerosis. And the good news is, uh, it's easy to lower cholesterol for most people just mm -hmm. by just stop eating it. This is what I tell people all the time. Like you want to lower your cholesterol, stop eating cholesterol, right? The only source of cholesterol is animal food and especially saturated fat and cholesterol. So, um, when you stop eating animals, your cholesterol starts to come down and it keeps coming down lower and lower and lower, and it will, it will find an optimal level for your body. Your liver makes cholesterol, so you won't be deficient. And people, I hear people say, oh, you need cholesterol for your brain. Yeah, your liver will make the cholesterol mm -hmm. you need. You don't have to sweat. You don't have to worry about it. And uh, you can get it down. There are still a lot of doctors that tell their patients, don't, you know, you can't lower cholesterol with diet, which is pretty insane. But you, uh, yeah, you can see massive reductions quite quickly, actually. Yeah. Uh, and fiber is a, another piece of that. Fiber is, is terrific for helping uh, drive, drive cholesterol down. Yeah, it absorbs excess cholesterol that's dumped by your liver into your colon, right? And so if if you have a fiber deficient diet, that's reabsorbed. And so you can end up with just sort of this recirculating high cholesterol. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed a couple heart disease doctors. You probably know them. Um, experts of Dr. Joel Kahn, mm -hmm. uh, cardiologist, plant-based cardiologist, Dr. Caldwell, Caldwell Esselstyn, both terrific sources of information for anybody listening uh, uh, on... Uh, eating plants, reducing or almost eliminating. Uh, you, you can never be completely heart disease proof, but you can be in the lowest mm -hmm. risk group with mm -hmm. a little, with a little deliberate effort, right? <laughs> or maybe a lot of effort, depending on, <laughs> you know, your life. But, uh, and that's the good news, right? It's just same with cancer, same with diabetes, all these chronic diseases, like you really can drop your risk mm -hmm. to the absolute lo lowest levels with your daily choices and eating fruits and vegetables in abundance, eating tons of plant food, uh, whole grains, nuts and seeds, legumes, herbs, and spices, you know, pig out plant food is good for you. Right. And, uh, so we got, uh, well, we're pretty short on time here, but is there anything else you'd like to add or anything fun you've learned or, you know, what are you most passionate about right now? I guess I would just, uh, leave the listeners with uh you know a, a message about their health and and to kind of summarize everything that we've been speaking about you know i look at my experience with my dad and i nearly lost him and for many people that go through that experience they do they they either die themselves or they do lose a parent or a loved one and really what i want people to to think about and the message that i want to land is don't wait for pain to start making the changes start now start today as as small as those changes may be just get moving in the right direction uh and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly in your corner. I know that everyone can do this. I've seen so many people make such incredible changes, even people, you know, in my own family that I thought would be the last people to look at changing their diet. You know, perhaps they didn't start off as quick as I would have liked, but they're, they're getting there and, and, and they're seeing the benefits. And I think that's the other real, you know, key thing here. It's, it's not just about the preventing of the chronic disease. It's about feeling better in our day-to-day -day and feeling more vital. 
and more energized and waking up so that, you know, we can take on the day and do all of the things that we love with uh, more energy, more vitality. And so uh, that would be what I would leave people with to, to kind of think about. Um, and uh, yeah, hope, hope that uh, they've enjoyed the conversation. Simon Hill, I appreciate you. I, I appreciate the fact that you are encouraging people and empowering them to take control of their health and that you're also bringing the science to them uh, so they can see this isn't just somebody's, you know, harebrained idea, mm. right? This isn't just some hippie idea, <laughs> right? Like that there's all this awesome, fascinating science showing dramatic reversal and disease progression, right? In healing the body, right? Reducing inflammation, strengthening your immune system, all these wonderful things, all these wonderful benefits. And it's just cool. I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing because it's, we, we need as many people on the team as possible. You know, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but when I was, when I was trying to heal in 2004, I mean, there was no information online. I, I just went from book to book. And a lot of the books I read didn't have much science in them, right? They were, they were more hy hypothetical, right? Propositions of what a person should do to try to help their body heal chronic disease, right? They were, they were anecdotal and hypothetical, right? And, but they made sense to me. And so I, I decided to radically change my life and overdose on nutrition and go hardcore and eat a raw food diet for, for a long time and a plant-based diet even longer. And so it, I'm just so thankful that again, that you're doing this because I, you know, I didn't discover nutritional science until, I don't know, six, seven years after my diagnosis. When I started sharing my story, I realized, oh, wait a second, I, is there anything to back this up, <laughs> right? Is there anything to back up what I believe helped me, right? Like that, that eating uh, 15 to 20 servings of fruits and vegetables every day helped me, right? Am I just a fluke? Am I just lucky? And then that's when I, I started learning about nutritional science and d diving in and reading studies. And, and it, it got me so excited to see like, oh, wow, there is proof, right? There is proof out there. We just, we just haven't been told. And so, yeah, we need as many truth tellers out there as we can get, man. So, so again, it's awesome. The proof is in the plants. The proof is in the plants. And, you know, you just really summarize why I wrote the book. It's, it's, I, I said at the start, it, it can be very confusing for people to understand what a healthy diet looks like. And the aim of the, the book and my intention with it was to give people real information, objective information, up-to-date science that they can grab a hold of and start to make some of these changes with confidence and, and feel uh, empowered. And uh, I probably should have added just before when I was talking about getting started, I think we shouldn't forget that this is super delicious as well. You know, this is not about sacrifice. This is about gaining so much more than 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 what you may be thinking you're giving up. And uh, I know, I know, Chris, you just brought out a, a cookbook, so uh, I can kind of throw people to that as well because I'm sure there are some <laughs> some uh, many incredible uh, recipes in there. So that once you have the science and you're feeling confident. Um, you know, you've also got the practical side of things covered to make sure that you are enjoying it because this is not about letting go of the, the joy of food. We should all uh, strive to maintain that because food is to be enjoyed and, and shared with friends and family. And, uh, you know, I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. Yeah, it's true. We aren't just eating weeds, acorns, and tree bark. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, it's easy. Uh, it, it it's easy to eat healthy uh, once you just get a little bit of guidance, and you find foods that you enjoy, and you find, learn how to prepare them in ways that taste good to you. And yeah, that is what my new book's about. But this is not about my book; it's about your book. So, uh, <laughs> so people can find you at plantproof.com. Mm -hmm. They can uh, join your community, connect with you there. You're on Instagram, I know. Your book is called The Proof is in the Plants. It's on Amazon, probably uh, mm -hmm. easy to find in a lot of bookstores, correct? Yep. Anything yep. else I, we should plug? Uh, no, that sounds good. Yeah, socials is at plant underscore proof. 
Uh, and if you want to listen to more of what I have to say or any of my guests, you can uh, tune into the Plant Proof Podcast. Perfect. Simon Hill, this is really fun, man. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate you. Keep up the good work. You Thanks, too. everybody. Please share this video with people you care about. They need to know that your, their diet and lifestyle choices can, can affect their health, can improve their life, can reduce their risk of disease. So it's just, just one more interview uh, to, to, uh, to further the mission. So spread it, share it. We'll see you on the next one.